You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim. Renee couldn't join us today, so I'm running solo. But be not worried. We have a Mount Rushmore level guest from the sound design world joining with us today. On the line, we have Richard King. Welcome to the show, Richard. How are you today? Thanks, Tim. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Listeners will all know who you are, Richard. We all know that you have six Oscar nominations. We all know that you have four wins. We know that you're as comfortable doing massive CG blockbuster superhero films like The Dark Knight as you are in smaller fare like The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, one of my personal faves. You were previously on our podcast in episode 86, where we walked down memory lane on some of your many, many highlights of your career. But today we're going to look forward. We're going to talk about 2020, where you were the sound supervisor on Christopher Nolan's film Tenant. This film is a mind bender and needs sound to help tell its story in a very unique way. Time is running forward at times. It's running backwards in other shots. And there are many shots where it's running forwards and backwards in the same frame. So I guess my first question to you today, Richard, is what was your philosophy on how to tackle the sounds when things are running in reverse? It's a, a philosophy that evolved over the course of working on the film. Of course, we just initially tried the simple and obvious trick of running sounds in reverse to match the inverted images. But it became clear pretty quickly that that, that more sounds like a, a, a technical mistake or a technical device anyone can recognize as something they can do on their, you know, computer. Um, and it also didn't make sense in a weird way physically. Um, Chris really wanted to try to, as much as humanly possible, adhere to the rules of physics in this. There's even a, there's a famous physicist uh, who is a um, technical advisor on the film who worked with him on Interstellar, who <laughs> Chris was bouncing ideas off of him about what might be physically possible in the, you know, the nether reaches of theoretical physics, you know, as much as possible without making a big deal about it. We tried to kind of stick to that, that theory. And so it seemed to us that whereas the object may be moving, it's time uh, sequence may be reversed. The sounds and sights and, and light that bounces off of it that emanates from it aren't going in reverse. They're, they're, they're operating in our world and our, in our physics. So we ended up constructing most of the inverted sounds using forward running recordings, but either manipulating a prop to make it sound like it's reversed or manipulating a car, uh, you know, operating to make it sound like it's inverted um, so that its signature basic sound is recognizable. But during the course of that sound, it maybe modulates or, or ramps up or ramps down in a different way that would be unusual to us. All of the fight scenes were, uh, especially where the, um, there's the forward reverse, forward inverted and inverted antagonists fighting. Uh, all those sounds are forward. However, sometimes we would do a little whoosh in on something to make it more dramatically effective. But the vehicles, we, we work really hard to try to perform the car maneuvers in such a way that they emulated what the car is doing in the picture, but the pitch and tone of the sound is going in reverse. By like recording reverse, a lot of reverse skids, we recorded the cars in reverse, although that didn't work out so well. We ended up using mostly forward running vehicles. You put some special sauce on the gunshots though that were in reverse, right? Can you tell us a bit about that? The one area where we did do some monkey business was in the, um, in the gunshot. There's a little bit of a like an escalating rumble that builds up into the into the shots. It just felt like they needed some um, slightly different approach than many of the other uh, things. As you mentioned, the initial, I don't know if instinct is the right word, but for backwards stuff is to run the sound backwards at the same time. So I was expecting that, if you will. And when I didn't get that, I was really pumped about it because the way you tackle the sound, the way it turns out is really cool. And the other thing that kind of subverted expectations of how it's been done in every other movie is the turnstiles. You know, any other time where I've seen in a movie with a time machine, it's sci-fi, you know, magical sounds in it. Where the turnstiles in this are industrial sounding. Chris wanted it to be a, a fairly um, mysterious machine. He didn't, he didn't want to even try to go into the physics or the logic of what goes on inside that machine or how it works. 
it just felt better to leave it a little bit anonymous, like it's this clearly massive, gigantic rolled steel piece of machinery. Maybe is more electromagnetic in nature than than some sort of unknown technology. It's just a big, massive piece of machinery that does this mysterious thing. And so it was, it was kind of best to leave that, you know, kind of leave that a little bit to the viewer's imagination how uh, how that works. You mentioned earlier that there's a fight scene that is kind of taking place with one character going forward in time and one character going back in time. There's also a fight scene in a kitchen. And those fight scenes really popped for me. The punches sounded super unique and interesting. And I'm wondering if you could kind of give me a primer on how Richard King tackles punches. For one thing, it's about making each one distinct, each one sound different. So you're not, you know, repeating any any of the same sounds. Kind of like everything we do in all of Chris's films, try to make every moment, every event pop somehow or make it give it a reason to be there make it an event so when somebody hits gets hit in the gut there's going to be a specific sound for that somebody gets hit with a cheese grater there's going to be a very specific sound for that when he then punches the guy in the stomach with a cheese grater that gets a different sound so it's just about finding just the right character of the sound for each one and then maybe making them just a little bit more different I've never actually been in a fist fight like that. So it's, it's, um, it, you've never punched someone in the stomach with a cheese grater. I have not. No. So, it, <laughs> so it's, but, but it's just about making a, a real point at each of each moment, making a little bit of a meal of every little opportunity. And how we work on Chris's films is we work very hard for the first temp mix to get everything kind of in the ballpark. And then, um, and then we settle in for several months of uh, refining and honing and uh, rethinking. And it's a great way to work. It's a great way to flesh out these little tiny moments that we can really make make a point of rather than just have them be sync effects for the picture. Um, with the punches specifically, they're usually composed of a number of different sounds to add up to that one sound. And it is tonal, the gut punch deeper, face hit a little brighter, that element, as well as uh, just the, the character of the sound. Um, uh, also the reverberation in the environment, how that sound, which, you know, how that interacts with the environment. That was a kitchen, a, you know, sterile kind of uh, bouncy space. So we, we played on that a bit. Also it's, it's, you know, it's John David Washington's impressive moment of kind of showing us what he can do. And so we wanted to make it an exciting little sequence. It's kind of where he gains uh, a little bit of respect from Sator, maybe, or at least recognition that this guy maybe isn't who he seems. He's not doesn't work at the embassy. It's about variety, and it's it, it's the goal is to create as much variety tonally and at the actual character of the sounds as we can muster. And you know, I think that's what you hear when you walk through life every day is so much variety in in the sound just in the sound of something banal like traffic there's so many textures and and coarse textures and rough textures and bright and deep and rumbly and that's what life is like i think and we really try to invest very important for chris to invest his films with a sense of real life and what it feels like to exist in the world and I think that puts the audience in that world with the characters, which is our always our goal. For sure. How does one mix a film of this size in lockdown conditions? In um, it was March, we had a two-week tent mix scheduled. So we got to that two-week tent mix, which is always, in Chris's films, kind of the, a very key target date before he shows the film to the studio. And it's so it really has to work on all levels. So we put, we basically shut all the foley for the temp. We did everything for the temp and worked very hard to make it great. A couple of days into this two week mix and it's becoming clear that things aren't going well. San Francisco's locked down. So we started kind of formulating plans in our heads about how can we do this all remotely? We're all set up at Warner Brothers in Burbank. On day four, we had to shut down. Chris pushed us hard and we managed to finish it on that fourth day, we managed to get him a good solid screening uh, master. And then we all spent a week or so kind of 
setting up remotely. I set up a 5-1 studio at home. Uh, Gary Rizzo, who's the dialogue mixer, has a, a small home theater. So he brought some equipment home and set up there. My editorial team set up around town. We worked for five weeks like that, doing more temp dubs, updating the temp dub remotely, then send it to Chris. He would look at it in his screening room, give us notes. Worked remarkably well. We all missed the personal interaction. It was a little bit cumbersome. Transferring files was a lot slower, of course, and but we we managed it. Nothing was missed out on by not being able to see each other, uh, other than on computer screens. Um, we all repaired back to Warner Brothers for a couple of months of mixing. We all got letters to go in the lot and authority to be able to be there and uh, under tight. The safety protocols, we mix for two months in masks, l- very limited number of people on the stage, all separated by 10 feet or so. Were all the mixed theaters at Warner Brothers still running or were you the only ones there? Initially, we were the only ones there. We were practically the only people in the lot. And it was weird to drive in that lot and a place that would normally 10 or 12,000 people might be working in a given day. There was just nobody there, no cars, no people, you know, was, Security guards occasionally you'd see, but it was uh, really a ghost town. And and the only people that were in the building with us were engineering and myself, my assistant, and Chris, and the editor, and the mixers, and the mix tech. Um, it was kind of weird and, 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 and strange, but we were also locked into the film that that kind of becomes your, your primary focus. So in a way, it kind of isolated us in a maybe good way in that it, we were able to really, you know, completely focus. And also we were so relieved to be working and just to be able to take our minds off what was going on and, and uh, be engaged in something fun and creative and, and, and felt like we were doing something interesting. And mm-hmm. So Tenet was the movie that held its ground. All the other major film releases, blockbusters moved back to next year and Tenant held, I think it was July 15th, maybe, was going to be the release date. You were under the full assumption it was coming out in July, right? Yeah. Yeah, we were working for a July release. And, and did you make that? Yeah, we sure did. We were ready. <laughs> <laughs> Negative was cut. You know, they, we were ready to go. The, the film was done. Um, they made a decision based upon reality at that, at that point in time that I think everyone recognizes, you know, there's just, well, there's just nothing else to do. I mean, this, we were all in, we all, as we still are in a way, we, we were all in uh, uh, on new ground and, and, and just trying to figure out how to navigate our, our, our work life and our, our home life and, and everything else. Um, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm glad that it did get, it did get a run in theaters and um, I got to see it in a the theater. Did you get to see it in a the theater? I did get to see it in a theater. Yes. So I saw it back in September in the theater. There were some theaters in California open uh, down in San Diego, south of here. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was good that it got a little, you know, the- theatrical play. And hopefully that could happen maybe again with a bigger, bigger run, an IMAX run uh, at some point. Um, I hope people enjoy the film in any way they can get to see it. For sure. So last time you were on our podcast, I asked you a question of, are you the kind of sound supervisor that sits at the back of the room and lets the mixers do their thing? Or are you sitting at the, uh, right beside them, whispering in their ear what you want where? And you kind of erred towards more the side that you're more involved in the mix than other sound supervisors, maybe. So when you're doing that, or do you want to correct that? No, I, that's, <laughs> I feel like we're all collaborators. And I, I don't look at it like I've got to tell them what to do or they've got to tell me what to do. The atmosphere is completely collegial. It's like, you know, we're just all trying to make this as cool as possible. And I come into the mix having done a lot of, I preed up all the sound effects and, you know, they're in a pretty tight shape. And I know that the way the sounds are constructed and the way they're put together is to Chris's liking because I've sent him mixes of those, you know, some scenes. So, um, you know, I mean, a little precious about some of the things that I, I've done and I want to re- retain that. But the way all of us operate is if somebody has a, a better idea, then, then, you know, there's no ego. That's a great way to work. One thing I want to ask about that kind of dynamic is in this movie, there are lots of explosions. And in the screening I was in, the explosions were concussive. 
they hit me in the chest. I felt the explosions as much as I was hearing and seeing them. Is that something that you're building into your pre-dubs? Is that something that your mixers are magically bringing out with their uh, subwoofer wizardry? How do you go about making these explosions just so powerful? Well, you know, we, we have to start with the sounds because we, we don't want to just rely upon the subwoofer and really want to utilize sounds that uh, carry a lot of energy off the screen speakers and, and a lot of low end off the screen speakers. Yeah. So it's not just that one note sub hit, you know, although that's part of the process. Explosions, it's surprisingly hard to make sound like real explosions, just like gunshots. It's very hard to make them sound like real gunshots. I had an interesting experience working for the five weeks I worked at home. I have a couple of dogs that are very afraid of they get very freaked out if there's fireworks or if they hear like thunder or i was struck by the fact that they didn't they weren't responding my my playing back machine guns at full level downstairs in the house i, I got no response from them they would you know they wouldn't they wouldn't wake up i came to realize there's just something very different about the way that kind of sound propagates in air than what's captured on a recording so the goal was always to try to find a frequency or find a sound that would get the dogs to wake up. Like that almost became my proof that I was getting close to something that was real. You don't want them to just sound like big booms. I mean, you want to feel that concussion. You want to feel that massive amount of air and all the invisible stuff that happens with an explosion, stuff you can't see, the shockwave. So yeah, it's also about, it's about finding interesting sounds that maybe even high-end sounds, like a crack, a rock crack or a something that distinguishes each explosion because there's a lot of explosions. So you want to make, make them all kind of unique and give them a different uh, personality. And, and the, the only trick is just to keep trying until you really feel something. And sometimes it's just a, a, a mixing thing. You know, Kevin O'Connell uh, mixed the sound effects and he would occasionally come up with a, a cool like reverb or something that would, that would enhance or make something sound uh, particularly unusual which there are places we were going for that um all of the stuff that all of us do in sound it's it's a lot of trial and error and trial and error until you feel like it's right and then about creating that unique experience for the for the audience um the goal is to, is to really give the audience something they haven't seen or heard before in that way bring them into the logic and into the world of the characters make them feel like they're in there and a lot of our our chipping away and refining process is coming up with all those little perfect sounds which may not be the go-to sounds but maybe something completely different that we finally realize oh wouldn't it be cool to try this highlight that sound or just just, just kind of make the world as rich and as unique and as full of surprises as possible you brought up something that I'd like to follow up on. So you're on the mix stage with Gary Rizzo doing dialogue and Kevin O'Connell doing sound effects. And you mentioned that sometimes Kevin comes up with a reverb that really enhances something. While Kevin is experimenting with new reverbs, that slows down the process for Gary. What's the workflow for everyone else when someone wants to dig into something specific? A lot of times it's, it's Chris, you know, pushing, saying, can we do something different with that? So we all put our thinking caps on and try to come up with something. Um, and it's just about somebody saying, I got an idea. Let's try this. But it's usually directed by Chris. He, he really wants to, his goal is to get through the whole film in a week, screen it on Friday and do that same thing every week for eight weeks. So it's a quick process, but that prevents us from getting bogged down anywhere, getting too obsessive or look at the whole movie and see what's missing or what's wrong or what we can do better. That's the reason I really value my time before we start the final mix, because I can get a lot of these things. I can really nail a lot of these things and at least get them working. So Chris may want to change the sound, but it's not because the sound is a work. It's because maybe there's a more interesting sound that hadn't been thought of. We come into the temp mix usually holding a pretty strong hand and knowing that um, he's liking the direction that we've gone in and, when time needs to be taken, and there were a few of those times during the mix, we take the time to stop down and spend a half a day rethinking, retooling, reconfiguring, um, trying everything, anything and everything. And that's what's such a great pleasure and thrill about working with Chris is he 
is he really wants to do that. He wants to mine every every moment of the film, and and that just gives it such a vast playground to work in. No, it's thrilling. It's thrilling to work with him. Cool. So I just want to back uh, up on something. So when you're doing your multiple weeks on the final mix, you're saying that in week one, you go through the entire film, watch it on Friday. And then on week two, on Monday, you start back at the beginning and start tweaking and go through it all again in week two and then watch it all again on Friday. Is that your process? Yeah. Well, we had the temp dub to start with on uh, day one. So we have that, that temp dub, which has been refined a few times. And so we have a, we start off on that day one of the final mix with a good mix and um, just one that still needs a lot of shaping and, and, and it, it sounds more, uh, more difficult than it in reality turns out to be because Chris also kind of wants to pick his battles, you know, go, go for the big things first. And I find it to be a very efficient way to work because you don't have an opportunity to get uh, stuck. If you feel like you get stuck, then you just move on and keep working on that problem in the background. It gives momentum to the mix and it makes, you know, gives us the feeling that we're really, we're, we're making progress and that there's, there's always on any given day, there's always a, a, a bunch of hits and some misses. The misses we either fix or put on the back burner for, for the following week and um, now become the way he works and it's also more fun because you're you're moving fast and you're you're juggling a lot of things and you're you know that if you haven't nailed something and you need to go back to the drawing boards and work on it you're not burning stage time doing that and other good work is being done um while you're you know, working on other problems. So it's, it's very efficient too. So we've mentioned Christopher Nolan a bunch of times. He's worked with you on many, many films now. Has anyone else on your sound crew been around for many films with him as well? Or do you rotate through sound crew a lot? It's a pretty steady group. Uh, Andrew Bach has been working with me for like 20 years. He's done all of Chris's films that I've done. Um, Michael Mitchell's another person that has done all the films, a flex editor. Yeah, Randy Torres has done uh, several of Chris's films. You know, there's a little inner group. Uh, the Mixer, uh, Gary Rizzo has been on every film. Gary's done actually one film, started on one film before me, Batman Begins. Alex Gibson also has worked with Chris even longer. I think Alex worked on Memento. Alex is the music music editor. And so they all kind of know the drill. And, and I think it's a comfort zone thing for Chris because he knows that we know how he likes to work and, and good shorthand for me. I know I, I don't have to guide people or they can be just kind of left alone. In the in editorial, we trade a lot, trade sessions back and forth. You know, Michael or Randy will cut an effect sequence. I'll get that session. I'll work on it a bit, give it back to them. So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a constant ongoing refinement uh, back and forth. I'll get the sessions and mix them a little bit or recut some stuff or add some stuff. They'll get them back. They'll recut some stuff, add some stuff. Kind of the whole process through sound editorial, through mixing is, is all, a, is all an evolving, revolving. Nothing's kind of finally finished until the very end of the final. We're still kind of refining and polishing things and things keep cropping up. It's a, an excellent way to work. And I think that having my, my go-to people, my go-to team is incredibly important. You know, it's also a great sense of like, we're all brothers and sisters in this. We all know the drill and we all know uh, the sky's the limit, basically. Last time we spoke for Tone Benders, we spent a long portion of our conversation talking about gathering sounds for each film, going out field recording and getting a palette of sounds for the film. Did you do any interesting field recording for Tenet? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, I wasn't able to be at all of them because they were, a lot of them were in other parts of the world and where I wasn't. Elam Hawkins, who's a great sound effects designer and recordist uh, in England, recorded the um, boat, the sailboat. The scene with the floating catamaran race boat. Yeah, uh, very unique boats. We just simply aren't available. So that we, we, got a, we got onto the production end of that. And Elam spent a week down in Southampton recording those boats. We did all the vehicles. I, I, we found uh, an M5, which is what I wanted to use for the BMW that uh, John David Washington and Robert Pattinson 
using the film in the truck chase scene. We recorded a bunch of cars out in this airport out north of, north of LA that uh, we can rent for the day. And background recording all over the world in, in Scandinavia, in India, Italy. So there's a lot of getting the raw materials, which we were able to get early. Getting sounds from sound libraries is actually incredibly efficient too. There, you can't, you simply can't record everything. And what, what you want is not my recording. And what you want is the best recording in the world you can find to go in the movie. A lot of sounds are, it's kismet. I've heard gun recordings, for instance, on YouTube that sound better than, than anything I've ever heard. We get those exact guns and go out and record them and sometimes they don't sound as good. So it's, it's just, a, it's about something about, you know, something that happened on that day that something was recorded. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in also using sound libraries. I think it really opens up your potential sonic world and increases your palate radically. And, you know, you just have to do a bit of searching to find the thing that's going to be just right for you. And it may not be the most sonically perfect recording. Sometimes it's just there's something about the character or the, or the sound or the, or the drama of in that recording that is, that's, that's just perfect. And um, recording for this was important because we really wanted very specific sounds and, luckily had the budget and the opportunity and the worldwide contacts to be able to record what we needed. So I have to ask you the obligatory question about, I don't know if controversy is the right word, but there was a lot of dialogue about the dialogue in Tenant. People were saying that they were having trouble hearing it. Were there conversations going on on the mix stage about how far to push that kind of thing? We weren't pushing being an audible. We were we were working to make every word heard. and We, we, we did you know, to our satisfaction on the dub stage. We worked hard within Chris's philosophical framework of using live natural sound uh, and making it sound real. That is sometimes in life, you know, a person drops a syllable or drops the end of a line or that's just the way it is. And, and you intuit that in life generally by what the person said before that, by their body language, by the context of the conversation. So, we uh, we work very hard to make everything very audible. Um, and, you know, I just find it very interesting that people are much more forgiving of theater, of painting, of music, for trying things new. But film just seems like something that people are very resistant to accept something different. With Chris's films, you're going to get different. That's what the point of doing what we're doing is. You know, I've, I've heard those comments. And... I've heard almost as many comments saying, I heard everything fine. You know, the theater that we went to in San Diego, which wasn't a super great theater, it was all right. We didn't have any problem. And I, I took a bunch of young people, uh, friends of my son's, who's my son. Yeah, they, none of them had any problem understanding it. So I, I think it's, I think perhaps it's poor theater quality that people are responding to, which we all know is a problem. It's also, uh, Chris likes to have the dialogue in with the film. He doesn't want it to it kind of pop out. He wants it to be part of the sonic landscape. And uh, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, there's a lot of kooky stuff to try to digest and figure out. I don't know if missing part of a line here and there is going to help you in understanding it better. Take it from me, because I've heard all the dialogue uh, a thousand times, and I there, there are questions that I still have. So I just wish people would to try to watch it, take it on its own merits, and rather than try to pigeonhole everything the way something should sound. Or I know a lot of it's you know people in the in the industry who believe in a certain philosophy of how how movies should sound. Um, but I would encourage people to you know listen with an open mind and understand that every sonic decision was made on purpose. There's nothing accidental or nothing that slipped by us or nothing that we ignored or tried to obfuscate intentionally. No, if, if you take it on a stone face value, everything in that film is, is very carefully calibrated and thought through and rethought through and rethought through again. And we ended up with what we believe are the, is the best 
best possible mix for this movie. I read, uh, I think it was Variety or something. Someone wrote an article about the sound, which as a sound person, sound is never written about in mainstream press. So anytime that something bubbles up uh, to that level, it's interesting for sound people to read. And then I went and saw the film and was baffled by what they were talking about because uh, I had no problems with the sound. There were, as you say, sometimes uh, the end of a sentence or something you lost, but it didn't make any difference in the grand scheme of things. In fact, I really like there's a scene in India where they're walking kind of in a covered sidewalk. The ambience around is quite loud, but that's what India is like, I would imagine. I haven't been to India. So it made perfect sense to me. I thought that it was all massively overblown from uh, the screening that I saw, at least. A lot of this came from one or two bad screenings in bad rooms for critics. And then word got picked up and amplified by people who hadn't seen the film before. I think it was a big uh, cauldron of nothing that kind of erupted. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's always great to talk to you. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks for the great work you did on this film. Thank you so much, Tim. It was a great pleasure. Film Bitters is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H, or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. If you are interested in more pro-audio related content, stay tuned to hear what other members of the Audio Podcast Alliance are releasing. To learn more and find links to other shows similar to ToneBenders, go to AudioPodcast.org. Hi, this is Christian from the Sound Effect Podcast. In our latest episode, you'll hear Sergio Diaz and Zach Sievers talk about their sound design and mixing work on Gold Lion winning feature film, Nomadland. Check it out at thesoundeffect.com forward slash podcast. Hi, this is Emily from Level with Emily Reese. Our newest episode features two composers, Gary Scheiman and Nikolai Strawinsky. You might know Mikolai from The Witcher 3 or Gary from Bioshock. They wrote a score together for the game Metamorphosis. Hear them talk about it on the newest episode of Level with Emily. Learn more at levelwithemily.com 